You're listening to the Home Ownership Podcast by Movementum Realty, real estate talk for buying, selling, and owning property. Hey guys, Sean Patrick Maloney here, broker owner of Movementum Realty, located in Hanover, Massachusetts. Welcome to episode 15, Mold in the Home. I'm your host, Sean Patrick Maloney. I'm here today with Al Hall of Bay State Mold Advisors. Thanks for joining me, Al. Thank you for having me. I look forward to talking more about mold with you, Al. Can you tell me a little bit about your company? The company is Bay State Mold Advisors. Uh, We had our first certification in 2008. We hold three certifications, mold inspection, remediation, and assessor. This allows us to identify mold uh, and be able to state in a report that it is actually mold. Interesting. Yeah, so I know that there's quite a bit of talk always of mold and there's a home inspection everyone's worried about and there's a lot of processes during the whole process of buying a home as well as just owning a home that are identifiers where you end up figuring out that you have mold. Is it safe to say one of the best ways for a non-trained person to realize they have mold is to pay attention to the smells? Smells and visuals. Look for signs for water stains. So mold is kind of something that I've heard the word omnipresent used, but ever present in the environment, and there are lots of different types of molds. What's the main thing that you want to be doing to prevent mold? Control humidity and moisture. Mold starts to grow in an atmosphere where the relative humidity is at 62% or higher. So if you want to keep mold from growing on an indoor environment, you want to shoot for around 50%. Would you highly suggest, or what's your suggestion rate as far as who needs a dehumidifier? It seems like some people say, I need one. Some people say, I don't need one. What's the best way of determining if you actually need one? Get yourself a humidistat, or actually a couple of them, and place them around the house. The basement is obviously number one. But even your living space, even with today's modern technology of air conditioning, sometimes they fail and you really need to know if your AC is cooling and drying your air. So using a humidistat is the easiest way to monitor the humidity in your home. For our homeowners listening that might not know what a humidistat is, can you tell them a little bit more about what that actual device is? Sure. It's a little monitoring device that measures humidity in the environment. That's all it is, just this little thing that there that what's have been used in dehumidifiers to tell you how humid a place is and when it should turn on and off. Well, this device is literally just a little box that you can put anywhere around the house that measures humidity. It's Usually they're all digital now. So they're fairly inexpensive and easy to get at a hardware store or something? Hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, I see them at Walmart all the time. Okay, excellent. So just putting those in and maybe even if you can't get a bunch, moving it around and figuring out your what you have for humidity in an area is important. But the basements, it seems like, and maybe it's just me being a New England-based person, it seems like pretty much everybody should have some sort of, even if it's just seasonal, some sort of dehumidifier going in the basement area. I strongly recommend it. The basements that are made in New England, they're 99% made out of concrete. Concrete's very porous, so moisture travels through them. Very few homes have I seen where they put a moisture barrier around the, the concrete before they poured. Uh, on the, the dirt and the ground to keep the moisture from getting in. So we always have a humidity source feeding into the basement. So it's really a good idea to have a dehumidifier and to make sure you, whether you need one or not, is have a humidistat. The paints that they offer, those epoxies or the real thick paints that people paint the basement with, are those going to help or hurt you in a mold situation? Yes, there are waterproofing paints that will stop moisture migration from coming through. They stop water pressure, liquid, as well as vapor barrier. Or vapor pressure. So that will re- help reduce the amount of humidity getting into the basement from the foundation walls. There are specific products that can be applied to the concrete floor as a fortifier and sealer. Just because it's a stain doesn't mean it's a sealer. You want something that's going to actually seal the concrete to keep moisture from coming through. So thinking about homeowners, they have the home and they're just getting ready. They're thinking about selling the, the property and they think they might have mold. What's the next step to take when it comes to you think you might have mold, you're getting ready to sell, and you want to make sure that you don't go to home inspection or have an issue later on where you chase the buyer away by accident because the mold is then exposed. What's the best way to go about it at that point? Well, if you think you have mold, there has to be a reason why you do. If you think you have mold, you have reasons to consider it, call or hire a professional mold inspector to come in and look for the signs and symptoms to help you determine whether you have a nuisance or if you have a problem. 
when it comes to molds, it seems like there's a lot of different types. Are all molds bad? Any mold can act like an allergen depending on the individual person. So depending on their sensitivities, it could be anything with just like a cold, flu. For some, it could be anaphylactic. It just depends on the individual. Now, there are more toxic molds that are what we call in our industry target molds like Aspergillus and Penicillium. And the most common, Stachybotrys, which as everyone knows as the toxic mold, toxic black mold. The, some of these molds like Stachy produce mycotoxins or gases that are poisonous to the human body. Those things we really want to keep an eye on. So is it all black mold is black mold or is it some are colored black and they're not actually black mold? Great question. The color of the mold is not dependent upon, it's de it is dependent upon its species and the food that it's eating. So mold could be just about any color, including black, and not be stachybotrys. However, stachybotrys is always black. When it's active, it's a dark, dark black and it's gooey. When it's inactive or because the moisture's dried up, it's a charcoal black and powdery. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Bar Rescue, but... I love whenever Tafford says, if that's black mold, I'm shutting this place down. And so it always shows to me that it is very important that you deal with black mold and that you don't just paint over it or avoid the situation by boxing it in or any situation like that. Say you were to just box it in, it can, can it still get at you? Is that a safe mitigation or should you deal with it? Well, in my industry, there's a term called encapsulation. If the water source is dried up and you encapsulate the toxic mold, it is still there and it can still come back to life if moisture gets added. The encapsulation will not stop it from growing. So when you're talking stachybotrys, you really want to remove it as much as possible. If it can't be removed, then you want to make sure that it can stay dry and then do your encapsulation. That is the absolute last step, the last uh, approach to get at something you can't remove. I know often in New England, you know, we have a winter where we have frozen ground and we get that one-off water into the basement or we have that one-off where we have some ice dams and it overflows into the upstairs attic and everything. What's the rule of thumb as far as when do we need to talk about removing and opening up walls versus when do we just simply try to dry it up from the outside and hope it didn't happen? Typically, if a wall gets wet that has... Uh maybe with standard building materials such as sheetrock. If the sheetrock gets wet, you want to open it up and get it dry within 24 hours. After that, mold can start to grow anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, depending on its species and the water saturation. Whether it's an ice dam or a flooded basement, uh, something came through the wall, a broken pipe, you need to get it dried up within 24 hours. If you don't, you're, you're going to have to start looking at uh, monitoring for mold. And how about the more common ones, like things that you see in the bathroom, maybe on the ceiling above the bathroom ceiling? I know a lot of old, I guess you'd call them basically wives' tales, are to just grab a bottle of bleach and water and to just spray it on it and to that'll just wipe it off and then there it goes and it's gone. Unfortunately, the, the EPA and other regulatory agencies did have that as an instruction back in the 50s before they understood how bleach works at the microbe level, and especially with mycotoxins. Bleach is great on tub and tile. It's great for killing that pink mold that grows on everything that's in your tub and tile. Great for that. But as far as on building materials, such as a painted ceiling, it can only be used as a mold stain remover. It's not a mold killer. Bleach is sodium hypochlorite at 94% water. So when you wash mold with bleach, you kill what's on top, you leave a bunch of water and a bunch of dead mold, and then the mold comes back twice as bad very quickly. And if mold is present in an environment somewhere, say you have mold on one wall, is there a higher likelihood that if you were to get moisture somewhere else in the home that you would end up with more mold per se, or is it just always there and waiting? How, how does that work? Well, there's always mold spores in the atmosphere, and they're always settling all the time. So if, there, if an area is damp, the mold is going to settle there and then colonize. If it's a building with high humidity, then you have a high probability of the mold growing on the surfaces in any place where the humidity is high because the mold spores are there, just that they're microscopic. Once they've settled and start to colonize, that's when you begin to see them after it gets very well established. That's when you visibly can see it. Question for you that I had was, if I'm a renter and I'm in a home and there's mold present, are there any sort of rules in Massachusetts protecting me as far as as a renter? Uh, that's really up to the Board of Health 
If a Board of Health inspector comes in and sees it, he'll say to the homeowner, it's got to be cleaned up. If it's a toxic mold and it's obvious to him that it's, it is, or a report comes in and says that it's toxic mold, then the Board of Health has the right to say this building is uninhabitable and the owner has to find suitable housing for the renter until the mold problem is taken care of. So basically, it seems like the best in the first avenue would be to report it to your local Board of Health official and have them come in and do an inspection. Well, they'll come in and do a visual inspection. What you want to do is have a professional inspector come in and identify what mold is there and at what levels. And then the Board of Health will have information to make a judgment call on what to do because they can't look at it and just say it's toxic. They need to have a professional give the report. The Board of Health is not certified as a biologist or a mold inspector or assessor. Next thing I wanted to ask you is a lot of times in homes we have towels or different things like that that stay wet and end up getting a little bit of mold on them. What's the best way to clean them up or get rid of them or what do we do at that point? Great question. If it's simple clothing like shirts and towels and blankets and stuff, usually just laundry will be enough. Sometimes there'll be an odor after you may have to wash them twice a little OxyClean or something like that. A non-chlorine bleach additive will help. But if it's something more sensitive, there are dry cleaners and there are some techniques that can be used to save more sensitive garments, but you'll need to speak to a professional like myself who can educate you on that directly. So now the next step I want to talk about, and I know obviously the best method would be to call out a company like yours and to have a full remediation done. But if a homeowner, they have Say they have mold in the basement and they're going to make the cuts and they're going to take the two feet of drywall out. What kind of safety precautions and ideas do they want to have in their mind as far as the fact that they're dealing with what is a toxic substance? If they're going to try and do the remediation themselves, they have to think on two lines of levels of protection. One, cross-contamination, not letting it get from the room you're working in to other rooms. Because at that concentration, you're going to create a bigger problem if it gets spread. Second, before you touch anything, you need to protect your body both your eyes, your hands, and your lungs. You need proper respiratory equipment. It is recommended to wear protective coveralls like, like Tyvek suits. So ultimately, it sounds like, I mean, it, it sounds like a big on-taking as far as just making sure that you're not going to hurt other family members by saving a few dollars and getting out there and whacking it all out with a hammer and throwing it in a dumpster out back. Um, I know that we all like to save money on certain things, but on the situation of mold, we're dealing with a health hazard. It's probably best to bring in the professionals, would you say? I would agree 100%. A friend of mine from Missouri said, he came out here and he said, Al, you guys go to an awful lot of trouble for doing mold remediation. Out in Missouri, we just open a window, cut everything out, throw it out the window. Why don't you do that out here? He said, well, we felt the same way about asbestos until we learned about it. Now we know we need to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I guess... We're all afraid to trip and fall and cut our knee because it's an immediate action-reaction type of situation where, you know, you know if you fall on the pavement, you've got a cut, you're bleeding, and it hurts. Whereas with the mold, you might cough that day while you're doing the process but not realize that the long-term damage is there. Yes, mold spores can create some very nasty infections in the respiratory system and mucous membranes. It can get in your eyes and cause infections. And these things may take time to develop. You can even get mold toxicity in your blood. So you really need to think about how to protect yourself when dealing with mold. All right, so let's move on to the next subject. We're selling a home. We get a home inspection, and the home inspection report comes back. As we know, home inspectors aren't going to say it is mold, but it comes back in a situation where they're saying a mold-like substance. Obviously, most of the time, as a seller, we try to rely on the buyer to go and do the rest of the inspections. But if I was a seller and I'm really trying to sell the house and I'm nervous about them doing it right, what would I do? Like, do I reach out to a mold inspector or who do I go to next when I have a mold-like substance? If a mold-like substance has been identified, you want to hire a certified mold inspector professional. You do not want to just hire anyone. You want to hire someone who actually has credentials that they can be verified a second party verification, such as NORMI or the IICRC, which is the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. Uh, But you want someone you can verify their certification so that you know you're getting a proper inspection. You're not just getting somebody come in who's looking to get a remediation job, but someone who's trying to identify what their actual problem is and the cause. So as the home seller, I mean, ultimately my goal is to sell the home, but the reality is that 
I could lose the sale if I don't have this handled correctly. So during the process of dealing with a mold remediation, is there any sort of certification or guarantee that a company may give me? Or you could even go over in specific what your company guarantees as far as when you take care of a mold problem. Well, in Massachusetts, they don't even require a mold inspector or remediator to have certifications. That's why we emphasize strongly that if you're going to hire a mold professional, get someone who has certifications, then the work that they do, they will oftentimes be able to give you either a certificate of treatment, a, cert a warranty, whether it's one to five years, or like a company like mine, we can actually, we're qualified to offer up to a 30-year warranty. On that warranty, just to dig a little deeper, are these product-driven warranties or are these work-driven warranties? Say, for instance, I get out two years and for some reason something happens and it shows back up. What does the warranty cover? A certificate of treatment means that whatever has been dealt with has been dealt with at proper standards. That means the mold that's there has been killed, but it may not be inhibited or protected from regrowth. A warranty for one year to five years is based on both. The one year is based on the quality of the work of the individual, not product-based. When you start getting into higher year warranties, this, this are remediation warranties that are based on the product. So you're actually paying for what you get. I'm certified through Anabec to apply their product. And with this, I can offer a 30, 35 year warranty on remodels, uh, remediations, and on new builds, I can actually offer up to a 50 year warranty. And these products that you're using when you're treating the mold, are they like paints? Just, just so we can get an idea, like what, what is it that you put down? What are you putting on? Well, it depends on the each individual job. If it's, if a householder is more sensitive to chemicals, then we use a green product, but you have less of a warranty with those. If you're someone who's looking for a stronger product, some are hydrogen peroxide based, some are ammonium chloride based, and these are more chemical kills of the of the mold. There are also chitosin based, which is a mechanical kill. It kills as it crushes like sodium carbonate, which is, uh, you've heard of um, concrobium mold control. That's what that is. It's a cousin of bacon soda. For inhibiting, you have everything from encapsulate paints like mold killing primer, Don John's Wicked White, which is a, a almost like an epoxy barrier. And then you have other products like for Anabec X70, which is a nano-based technology. It goes on like a latex paint, but it makes a moisture and vapor barrier that will not let mold spores get through. And if mold does land on it, because of the nanotechnology, it actually punctures that mold spore so it cannot live. So I'm just going to finish it up here. I just want to throw in a couple of quick things and maybe you can throw in a few. I want to give homeowners and buyers and sellers just a quick idea of some things to do to prevent the future of mold. So some of the most clear and apparent ones would be keeping your gutters clean at all times, making sure the downspouts where they leave the bottom of the downspout, they have extensions on them and they're not pulling against the foundation, making sure the grade of the land is away from the foundation, and then in the situations where you need it, actually installing maybe a dry well or some stone around the foundation to again continue to move away the water. Do you know of any other quick cures that are out there as far as things that will help a home when it comes to water? Well, all those are great ideas for getting water away from the foundation. That's really the biggest key. After that, if you have cracks and other leaks in the foundation, it might be good to inject those with waterproofing urethanes as opposed to uh, epoxies. Uh, epoxies tend to recrack as the foundation moves, but urethanes tend to flex with the, with the building and not recrack. It stops water for more long term. Moisture migration is also one of the biggest problems with basements, so painting them with waterproofing and, and vapor barrier proof paints was, is a good idea, and fortifying the, the floor with a, with a sealer that actually inhibits a moisture migration. Okay, well I hope this helps out everyone as homeowners. If you have any further questions about mold, how would they get a hold of you, Al? Well, we can be reached directly at 508-930-7326 or go to our website, baystatemoldadvisors.com. We can also be found on Instagram and Facebook. That sounds great. Well, thank you all for listening today. If you have any additional questions and you want to reach out to me, I can definitely forward them along to Al. You can feel free to message me, Instagram me, or any other methods. Make sure to follow our podcast, and we look forward to talking with you next week. Thanks for listening.